All right, everybody, good to see you all here. Let's get the lecture started for this afternoon. It still is really pretty cold outside. Is, is everybody managing all right? Okay. Um, so are you right? You're wearing shorts. It's nearly December. What are you doing wearing shorts? Okay, wow, that's, that's impressive. <laughs> okay. Um, so where were we? Yeah, that's right. Elastic physics and um, Hooke's law. That's the plan for what we're thinking about today. So last time we were looking at um, elastic physics and Young's modulus and how it relates to stress and strain. Um, and we saw that situation there where we had that elastic region of materials. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. That region, that part of materials where you stretch them a little bit and they're still in that elastic regime. They go back to where they came from. Now you might say, well, that's not the most exciting regime of materials. Maybe you want to really exert some very big forces, get some really big changes in your materials. But this situation in materials, this elastic region, it's so important in physics because it gives rise to such an extraordinary, almost unbelievable array of physical phenomena. So today, um, I'd like to start with a bit of a kind of plan for this week, some things we're going to be looking at this week, um, to give you guys a bit of a steer for where we're going to be uh, going with this. So let's take a look what the plan is for this week. Now, by way of a bit of illustration, I have this really cool, very new picture of Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. And it was just taken last month by the uh, Juno satellite mission. So what's interesting about this is that Europa is close enough to Jupiter that the gravity of Jupiter it exerts what we call tidal forces on the moon. And what that does is it heats the moon up by just enough that there's a hypothesis that there might be an ocean of liquid water on Europa. And it's one of the most promising other places in the solar system where we might uh, find conditions which are habitable for life. So that's what makes it an exciting moon just by itself. But the connection to the, the kind of physical connection that we're thinking about today is that the story with this starts with the gravity. So Europe is close enough to Jupiter that it's got these what we call tidal forces due to the gravity of Jupiter. And those forces, they compress the whole moon. So all that stuff we were learning about last week about Young's modulus and compressing things a tiny amount. Well, here we have a whole moon being compressed. So a really kind of much grander scale. And that compression, that work being done, that causes heating due to the, gets turned into thermal energy. So all that stuff we were learning about a couple of weeks ago about thermal energy, uh, that gives rise to the possibility of liquid water. So what I like about this picture is that there's a connection between a lot of the different physics concepts that we've been studying over the past few weeks. We've got gravity going into uh, compressive forces, going into heating. And that's kind of a theme that I'd like to develop in the lecture today, because today we're going to be building on from those elastic materials that we were looking at last time and looking at specifically this uh, relationship that we call Hooke's law. But what I'd really like to do, especially today, is to make connections to other concepts that we've seen previously. So uh, we're going to be looking at the work that we're doing, the forces involved, um, and the energy involved. So the energy that we get in a, st uh, in a spring, and also looking at the kinematics of what's going on when we're compressing a spring. So you might remember um, a couple of months ago, we were looking at all the kinematics and velocity and acceleration. So that's really important when we're thinking about the motion of anything on a spring. And the reason is that it's this effect that gives rise to waves. This is fundamentally where we get wave motion from by the physics that we're going to be learning about today in Hooke's law. And physics, um, sorry, waves, it's just an unbelievably important um, field of physics. There's just so many different applications, so many different areas where wave phenomena are absolutely essential uh, to understand. So next lecture, we're going to be looking at uh, waves, and it's really the physics that we're going to be learning about today, which gets us started on waves. So that's the plan for today and for the rest of the week. So let's start today 
by recapping one of the figures that we saw a couple of lectures ago. We had this um, stress strain curve over here. So remember the strain, this is how stretched out something is. And then the uh, stress over here, that's um, the force per area being exerted on something. And that's the kind of the internal pressure is what we talk about. Now, the interesting thing about this curve, if we remind ourselves, well, how is a strain defined? So strain, so that's delta L over L, okay? And then our stress, sigma, that's our force. per cross-sectional area. So that's all we have on these axes. Now, something interesting happens if we think about um, a particular material where we're not changing the underlying shape of the material. So if we think about the stick that we've been thinking about all the time, if we're exerting you know, a force on it, it's going to compress a little bit. We're going to get that delta L. But we're not changing the cross-sectional area. And we're not changing how long is the original length of the stick. So if we take a look at these equations here, if we keep our L constant, so we keep L constant, and then we also keep A constant. So this is a very common situation we have when we're not really deforming a material. So if we look what we're left with, if A is constant, then our stress, it's really just directly related to the force. And our strain, it's just directly related to our delta L, so how much we're changing this. So what this mean, means is that if we start with the graph of stress versus strain, and suppose someone says, well, no, I, I don't really want a graph of stress versus strain anymore. What I want is a graph of force versus extension. Well, we don't have to draw them a whole new graph because we know up to what the numbers on the axis are, the graph is going to fundamentally look the same. So we can change the labels on the graph. So I've now got extension on the horizontal axis and force on the vertical axis. So our graph of force versus extension, it looks exactly the same. If we're not changing our cross-sectional area and if we're not changing the total original length of our material. So last time we used delta L for our change in length. Whenever physicists were thinking about Hooke's law, the convention very often we use X for extension. So it means exactly the same thing. So that X there means exactly the same as the delta L. If you're following along in the textbook, they actually use an E, a lowercase e for the extension. So you might see that as well, but they'll just mean the same thing. It's how much we've changed the length of something. So this is our force versus extension curve. How much force we exert on something and how much it's going to stretch. Now, the title for today, it's all about elastic physics. Does anybody remember which part of this diagram is what we call the elastic region? Does anybody remember that? Fantastic. Very great answer. So the, the linear region, that great answer. OK, so what we mean by that, so this straight line bit over here. That's what we call the elastic region. So we can kind of divide our graph into the elastic region and then the inelastic region. So over on the uh, inelastic region, there's all kinds of interesting stuff going on over here and it's going to depend on exactly what the material is. But we can just group all that stuff together and just say, well, that's all inelastic. And then this region over here, the elastic region, so remember, this is the situation where we've exerted a small force on something and then it just goes back to how it was. That's what we mean by being elastic. And your explanation, therefore, what exactly do we mean by elastic? Great explanation, because what it really means is it's where this relationship is a line. So we say it's a, a linear relationship. There's a linear relationship between the extension and the force. And physicists, we absolutely love linear relationships. We absolutely love ourselves a line. That is a great thing. We know how to deal with lines. And then over here, it's not a line. 
it's going to be complicated. So we've got this example here of a ductile material, but once you've started stretching a material past the elastic region, kind of we can get all sorts of things going on here and exactly what the maximum tensile strength is going to be. Uh, it kind of depends on the material. So this is just one sketch of what we might get, but there's all kinds of things that might happen. So over in the elastic region, it's kind of nice and easy for us because the relationship between force and extension is just the line. So that's kind of easy. So we actually kind of like it over here. But then over here, once we're out of the elastic region, it's just, it's kind of a lot more complicated. And, and it's kind of pretty difficult to work with. There's not one single relationship we can use to go from our force to our extension. Now, physics, it kind of has a bit of a reputation as a kind of complicated, some people say it's a kind of difficult subject. But the thing is that this bit over here, where it's the nice elastic region, it's nice and easy, this is really where we do physics. And we're just starting to see some of the physics involved with this today and later in this week. But there's just an extraordinary, almost unbelievable amount of physics that is all based on the properties of things in this linear regime. Once we've stretched something beyond what we call the elastic regime, it kind of gets too difficult to fi for physics. And physicists, we tend to say, well, we this isn't really physics anymore. Now, there's not an exact hard definition between physics and other sciences. You know, there's lots of overlap. But in general, once we start stretching something out or compressing something so much that we're over here, physicists, we tend to say, well, well, we're going to leave that to the chemists or how that's going to behave. Well, we'll leave that to the engineers or maybe we'll, we'll have a whole field material science. We'll, we'll just leave this to them because it's kind of too difficult for us physicists over here. So like I said, physics, it, it does have a bit of an undeserved reputation. I think often a lot of jargon and complexities just get in the way. But fundamentally, physicists, we love nice simple situations like this where we have a straight line relation between the two concepts we're thinking on. That's what we're going to stick to. Now, you might think, well, it's a bit limiting. I'm kind of more keen on all this interesting stuff. But we're going to see a lot of amazing phenomena today and next time, all just staying in this elastic regime over here. So this situation over here, this is what we get whenever we just exert a small enough force on something that that extension is directly proportional to the force. That's what we're talking about. And it's really this regime that we're thinking about when we're dealing with Hooke's law, which is kind of what we're going to be focusing on today. So what I'd like to do in this uh, question over here is that in that previous graph, that's the force we're exerting on some material. So we're exerting some positive force and we're getting some change in length here. But um, Hooke's law, we're actually thinking about the force in the spring. So with this question, have a think about if we exert some extension, and we know our force, it's going to be that linear relationship. It's going to be directly proportional to the extension. What's going to be the equation for how our force is related to the extension? So a useful tip with this one is it's very often useful in physics to think about what happens at extreme values. So what happens for very large values? What happens for very small values? What happens for values of zero? So if you're trying to figure out which one of these could be describing the force on a spring, it's very useful to think about what's going to happen when the extension goes to zero. What are we going to want the force to do if the extension goes to zero? OK, let's take a look at the responses. Let's see what everybody gets for this one. Let's take a look. OK, so looks like most people are going for A, kind of even for B and C. Not so many people are going for D. Now, if we look at, which ones do we have here? B and D. These are all kind of situations where we have basically that our force is proportional to 1 over x. So maybe it's plus or minus. But the idea is that it's um, what we call inversely proportional there. So let's think about what would happen here if x goes to zero. What's going to happen to our force if x goes to zero like this? Any thoughts? Uh, 
So one divided by a very small number, that's going to give us a very big number. And as our x goes to zero, this force is going to explode up towards infinity. So remember, if we have a, you know, a spring and it's just in its equilibrium position, we're not stretching it or compressing it, we don't want there to be any force. We only want the force to come in if we start extending or compressing the spring. So if the spring's just sitting there not being extended, we don't want any force. So we know that it can't be any of these ones where it's so that the force is equal to, you know, k over x or minus k over x, because that would give us huge forces when there's no compression and then tiny forces when there's big compression. So the ones we're looking at are really a and c. That's kind of what we've narrowed it down to. Now, a, so that says our force is directly proportional to our extension. So that's actually a graph of what's going on in that force versus uh, extension curve that we were just looking at. But remember with that curve, that's the force that we're coming in and exerting on the spring. So we've got our spring here and we're exerting some force. And that's what the extension is going to be. The difference is when we're thinking about Hooke's law, we're thinking about the force on the spring. So not the force being exerted on it, but the force on the spring. Um, and the spring, it's always pulling itself back to where it's from. So if the spring's nice and happy here, if I pull it, it wants to pull itself back to where it was. So what that means is that the force is actually equal to minus kx. So the correct option there is option C. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. The correct option is actually the force is equal to minus kx. Now, I'm going to write this one down because, you know, we're going to be thinking about Hooke's law all day. Actually, let me get some coloured chalk over here. Um, here we go. I'm going to write it down some nice red chalk because we're going to be thinking about this for the whole lecture. So it's useful to have it written down. So write it as big as I can. So force is equal to minus k x. So this is what we mean by Hooke's law. This is what Hooke's law is, that our force is equal to minus some constant times our extension. And that minus sign is really important because what it means is if we have a bit of an x, the spring's going to push back and it's going to want to push back to where it was before. Okay? It's not going to want to be disturbed. And that really affects the physics that we get whenever we're looking at anything going on with springs. So if we take a look at what this looks like in a graph, with Hooke's law, we're always thinking about we've got some distance, so what our extension is, and then on this axis, we've got the force. So it's the same kind of idea as that graph we were just looking at of, you know, force versus um, extension. But the difference is now, this is not the force that we're coming in and exerting. This is the force within the spring. So we've always got this kind of picture here where we've got some spring with, you know, some mass and it's just sitting there. And that's what we call its equilibrium position. So it's not been stretched or compressed. That's where it just sits happily if there's no force acting on it. So if that's its equilibrium position, so that's when our x corresponds to zero, we know that the force has to be zero. And then if we wanted to stretch the spring, then we're going to get some force pushing us back. And then if we wanted to compress the spring, then we're going to have some force also pushing us back to equilibrium. So what the graph looks like, looks something like this. So this is just a graph of this equation here. So force is equal to minus kx. And this k, that's just the slope of the graph. That's what we call the spring constant. So this is some number and it tells us how stretchy or how springy a spring is and it sets the slope of that relationship. That's what's going on there. So let's think a little bit about what's going on with this spring constant here. So we've got our equation here. So Hooke's law tells us that force is equal to <coughs> minus kx. So let's have a think about what has got to be the units of the spring constant. So remember, with these questions, you don't have to guess. We know what the units for the force are going to be, 
we know what the units for our x have to be. So from that, we can figure out what the units for that spring constant have to be to make this whole equation work. OK, very good to see those responses coming in. Let's see what everybody gets for the units of Hooke's law. Let's see what we have here. OK, nobody's going for D, but then we pretty evenly split between A, B and C. So let's start by thinking about what goes into the equation. So what we put in, we put in some x. So that's going to have units of meters. And then what's going to come out is a force. And that's going to have units of newtons. So this k, whatever this constant is, that's got to take that distance in meters, divide out the meters, and multiply in some newtons there. So it's got to be newtons per meter. So that's option B over there. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go, especially if you got that it was uh, option B there. Now, in the workshop this week, we're going to have heaps of questions where we have things like, OK, here's the force on a spring. How much does it stretch if this is a spring constant? Or we can work out all sorts of so if we know how far we push a spring and we know what the force is, we can work out the spring constant. We can do all those kinds of calculations. And we're going to have lots of practice of those kinds of things in the workshop. But you guys are pretty strong with those kinds of questions. So what I'd like to focus on in the lectures are the slightly more conceptual kind of questions. So um, do make sure you come along to the workshop at the end of the week because it is useful to have some practice crunching some of the numbers for this, calculating some spring constants. Uh, but for now, let's start by thinking a bit more uh, about some of the concepts involved with this, because that's what the force we get on a spring is, so minus kx. Now, something that's really important whenever we're thinking about springs is how much energy is stored in the spring because we're exerting a, a force. So that might make you a bit suspicious that uh, we're going to be thinking about the energy involved here. So like I said at the beginning, I'd like to be kind of building on some of the concepts maybe we haven't seen for a couple of weeks, seeing how they apply um, in these new situations. So what I'd like to do with this question, so I've got a graph of force versus, oh, well, it's, it's just a surprise. You, you can't see that. Let me, let me move this thing out the way, because otherwise it uh, makes it a bit more interesting. OK, so now, as you can see, it's a graph of force versus displacement. This isn't a particular force. This is just some force which is constant, OK, versus displacement. So let's have a think about what does this shaded area of the graph represent. So we've got a few options there. Have a think about what's going on. I'll get the question going, and then we'll see what everybody thinks for this one. So if you're not sure about this one, it's very helpful to think about what the units of this area are going to be. So on one axis, we have force. On the other axis, we have newtons. So think about what that's going to give us for the units of this area, and what physical thing has those units. OK, very good. See those responses coming in. Let's see what everybody thinks for what does this area represent. OK, so we've got some people going for all of them. But if we have a look, so we've got force on that axis and displacement on this axis. So whatever this area is, it's force times uh, distance, uh, which is, of course, work. OK, so the correct option there as most people got there, it's option C, so uh, work. Okay. So remember um, from a couple of weeks ago, so work, it's just equal to force times the distance. Now, you might use a D for distance, or you know we can use an X for distance. So force times distance gives us work. Now, in this case, we have a constant force. So whatever our distance is, the force doesn't change. So maybe this could be the force of friction of something. We're pushing something along. Maybe we're 
you know, we're pushing something along a desk like this, and there's some force of friction. And the force of friction doesn't change with how far we've pushed. So the work we've done, we can just multiply that force by the distance. The interesting thing about this situation, though, is that this principle that the area under the curve of force versus distance is work. This is true whatever the equation for our force is. So how many of you have done some calculus, done some integration? Okay, okay, oh, so some people, not too many. Okay, so if you have done some calculus, done some integration, uh, we can actually write this same equation for if we don't have a constant force. So we can still say, you know, our work is equal to our force. But instead of just multiplying it by a whole big distance here, we just multiply by a little distance. And then we add up all those little distances. And that's what we mean by integration. And we can show that with this sign here, which is like a stretched out S. So if you've done calculus before, that's fine. You can probably spot the connection here. So our work is the integral of force times distance. If you haven't done calculus before, that's absolutely fine. Please don't worry about this equation. All it says is that our work, so the work we've done, it's equal to the area under the force versus distance curve. And it doesn't matter if that is a straight line or some wavy line or whatever it is. The work we do pushing against that force, it's always going to be the area. So let's see how this applies if we're thinking about that mass on a spring over here. So let's go back to this graph here. So force versus distance, and we've got this spring. So suppose we are compressing the spring. So we're coming in and exerting a force. Um, so we're exerting a force through a distance, so we're going to be doing work. And we can represent that like this. So we squash up our spring, and then the work we've done, it's this area under here. So that area under the curve. So you can see as we push more and more, the force builds up, and we have to do more and more work to push the spring the same amount. If we then come over here and then we stretch the spring out, then we also have to do work if we're pulling against its equilibrium position. And again, the work, it's just this area between the line and the axis there. That area is what represents the work done. Now remember that energy, it's always conserved. So if we take a, you know, our, our slinky here, so kind of what we've got, so it's kind of fixed over here, and then we've gone and done some work to stretch out the slinky. So we've gone and done some work, we've done some energy to stretch it out. And that energy, we say, is now stored in the spring, okay? So that's elastic energy. That's what we mean by elastic energy. It's equal to the work we have to do to stretch the spring to whatever position that we want. So graphically, we can represent it like that. So if we are stretching the spring, it's this area. Or if we're compressing it, it's the area the other side, okay? So we can represent the, uh, the area of the work done like this. So if we're compressing our spring, it's this area. If we're stretching it, it's this area. But what you'll notice is even though they're upside down like that, the area is the same. It's a symmetrical thing. So if we've stretched or compressed a material the same amount, we have to do the same amount of work. So now that we've got the kind of basic picture established, we can actually think about calculating, well, how much work are we actually doing? So with this question, that's what we're going to be thinking about here. So I've got the graph of force versus displacement. Now, this is a graph of positive force. And you might say, well, hang on, I you thought, you know, force is equal to minus kx. But what we're thinking about here is the force that we're coming in and exerting on the spring. So we're coming in and exerting this force. And the force we exert is equal to plus kx. So if you're reading up about Hooke's law, you might see it written without the minus sign. So that might mean that they're talking about the force someone is coming in and exerting on a spring. It might mean they're talking about the magnitude of the force. So just what the value is, not whether it's positive or negative. 
it might just mean that they've forgotten the minus sign, okay? So you've got some things to think about there. Um, the important thing to bear in mind is that the spring always pushes back from how it's been pushed, okay? So if you do think that maybe they've just missed out a minus sign, that's probably what's going on there. So always think about what's actually going on with the force and which direction it's going to be pushing. So let's think in this situation, the force we're exerting is equal to kx, and we're exerting it over a distance. We can figure out how much work we're going to do by this area of the graph. So let's give this question a go. Let's see what everybody gets for how much work we have to do on the spring. All right, let's see what everybody gets for this question. OK, so looks like some people going for all of them, but most people going for option C. So this is actually a similar kind of situation that we saw from a few weeks ago when we were looking at kinetic energy, when we were thinking about the work done as we were pushing something faster and faster. So we're really thinking about the area of this triangle over here. So the base of the triangle, that's just x. The height of the triangle is kx. So if we were thinking about the area of the whole rectangle there, that's going to be kx squared. But it's a triangle, so it's only half that. Okay. So as it looks like most people got, the correct option is option C there. Okay. So a half kx squared. So very well done, everybody, with that question. That's really good work with that one. So what this represents is if we're coming along and we want to stretch out a spring or we want to compress it, the amount of work we're going to have to do is equal to a half kx squared. Once we've come along and done that work, there's going to be that much energy stored in the spring. So you can stretch it out and then at some later point, you know, it, it's going to be able to uh, do some work with that stored energy. So very well done, everybody, with that question. Now, what I'd like to do now is start by thinking a little bit about what we call the dynamics, what's going to happen uh, if we do have a spring and we set it off moving. So if we've got our little slinky here, I'll try and, I'll try and keep it stationary there. So that's probably about as still as it's going to get. If I set the slinky off going, of course, we know it's going to start oscillating. And this is actually a really important situation in physics. And we can start to think about some of the dynamics of this. Because if we return to our big old Hooke's law equation here, so we know force is equal to minus kx. But we also know that this force from Newton's second law of motion is going to determine the acceleration of whatever is on the spring. So what we're thinking about in this question is if we have a mass on a spring, how is that extension x going to be related to the acceleration a? That's what this question is all about. So with this question, we're just doing a bit of algebra because we know that's our force due to Hooke's law, and we know that that force is also going to be equal to mass times acceleration. So with a bit of algebra, we can solve for what our acceleration is going to be. All right, very good to see those responses coming in. Let's see what everybody gets for this one. Okay. All right, so it looks like most people going for option A there. So just to work through the math, so we know that our force from the spring is minus kx, and that's equal to mass times acceleration. So we've got mass times acceleration is equal to minus kx. So then when we do the math, we get acceleration minus k over m times x. Okay, so just a bit of algebra with that one, making the connection to Newton's second law of motion. So which one is that up there? K over m times x, so option A. Okay, so very well done, everybody who gave this question a go. Now, this might just seem like a bit of algebra, but this is actually a very important kind of equation in physics, because what this equation does is it relates where our mass on the spring is to what the acceleration is. And it relates our acceleration to our position of where the spring is. So they're kind of couples like this. And 
this equation is actually what gives rise to the wave motion that we're going to be learning about next time. So even though you might think, well, elastic physics is all about compressing things and we, you know, squashed that chair a tiny, tiny bit last time, this equation here, even though it's a very unassuming equation, you know, acceleration minus km over x, this is the key to understanding wave behavior. Now, last thing before we wrap things up for today, I'd just like to show you guys quite a fun thing that you can try to give this a go yourself. So if you just do a quick uh, web search for PHET Hooke's Law, there's a really fun um, online simulation of everything that we've uh, gone over today. So I'll just show you guys what it looks like. So you can start it from there. So you just click go. And then what you've got is you've got your very own virtual spring that you can exert a force on and you can see how much work you're doing. So if we uh, take the, uh, the arm over here so we can stretch it out and we can see uh, the, the force increasing or we can compress our spring over there. And we can do all kinds of fun things. We can change the spring constants, change how stretchy our spring is, changes the slope there. So you'll notice this is a positive graph of force versus extension because this is the applied force. Okay, so the force we're coming in and applying. And so now that you know, we've uh, put the spring constant up, uh, we do more work if we want to change the spring. And then the other fun thing with this, it can actually show us the energy that we've done. So the work we've done, all the energy in the spring. So if I stretch it out, can you guys see the shaded region over there? So that's how much work we've done, how much energy stored in the spring. And then if we dial the spring constant back down, then we haven't had to do as much work. Then the other fun thing you can do here is you can have a look at a graph of the energy you need to stretch the spring to a given position. So if we take it back down to zero, we don't need any energy. Then if we compress it or stretch it, that's how much energy is stored in the spring. So that's the equation that you guys worked out a couple of slides ago. So it's quite a fun thing to play around with, get a sense of how the numbers change as you change the spring constant, as you change the displacement. You can see what the energy is, you can see what the, uh, the force is. So quite a fun thing uh, to have a play around with that. I'll post a link to this if you, if you didn't get, get it copied down so you can have a play around with it yourself, okay? Um, so remember, um, right after this, um, we've got the drop-in help session. If you've got any questions about this, anything that you'd like to ask, give this sim a go. Uh, it's quite fun to play around with. Um, otherwise, um, next time we're going to be going on waves on Thursday. So I'll see you guys all then, okay? See you next time.